Hey pals, Joey Pals here. I was taking a look at my most watched videos, and it seems you guys enjoy my Fire Emblem Fates videos a whole bunch. So today I decided to take another dip into the ocean's grey waves, and fish up who I believe to be the 10 best children characters within Fire Emblem Fates. These characters will be ranked based on their personality, how much lore they add onto their attached parent, their use on the battlefield, as well as personal preference. That should go without saying, these are my own personal opinions. Nowhere in the Holy Grail of Fire Emblem is it written that these 10 characters are the best children in the game. This is simply how I feel. Also, I will be using the children I made in my game, and fuss for matching parents when talking about their stat growths. Nowhere in the comments should be, ew, you paired up this character with this one? What is wrong with you? This is my file and how I got to understand these characters best. Now, without further ado, we have some characters to rank. Grab those seeds of trust, start those dual attacks, and begin marrying the adults like crazy. There's a lot of children, but only so many spaces on this map. Have you ever had anyone in your life that you really looked up to? Enough to a point where you want to do just what they were doing, possibly even better? Well, look no further for someone to empathize with in our number 10 entry. Sophie. Sophie, the daughter of Silas, and by extension my daughter, as I usually play female Corn and Mary Silas, is an almost determined girl with only one minor obstacle. Her horse. Her horse, Evil, is an absolute monster to manage, often rebellious due to Sophie's few uncertainties being conveyed to the horse. As a result, the horse doesn't listen to her no matter what she does, and often takes off on its own. Think of it as playing Legend of Zelda an opponent won't stop running around Hyrule Field, without going into any exit, and you have no escape. This is basically the reality that poor Sophie is saddled with right now, but fortunately, she's more than capable of holding her own. Those stats can be more difficult to calculate for children, I'll showcase them with my pairings. Silas got married to Corrin in my main file, and according to the lovely Fire Emblem wiki that many Fire Emblem YouTubers use, I can see that Sophie's stats, along with every other child's, can be calculated by doing this very simple formula. Mother's growth rates plus Sophie's growth rates divided by two, Plus class growth rates. Okay, so back to Sophie. Now that we know the formula, this shouldn't be a problem. Sophie just needs one parent and it's fucking corn. God damn it! Okay, so Sophie has V stats, while Corn has V stats when you remove both her class boosts and add my personal boon in vain. Clever and unlucky. If we mix the two together, this is what you get. Before class promotion. If you make her my preferred class for her, a paladin, she winds up with 50% HP, 55% strength, 30% magic, 58% skill, 58% speed, 45% luck, 38% defense, and 43% resistance. While slightly lacking in her defenses, Sophie is able to cleave through the battlefield like the Black Knight during the temper tantrum given the right weapon, right up there alongside Ryoma, Takumi, Camilla, and the other royals. Where she does lose points, though, is that while she has a sweet personality and a funny personal skill, she adds literally nothing to Silas's lore. She doesn't get growth rates from him, just like every other Fates child doesn't get growth rates from her fathers for some reason except for Shigore because Shigore is special, or further his legacy. All she does is get sidetracked with Abel. As a result of not really contributing to anyone besides herself, she gets the number 10 spot. God damn it, now what, Felicia? Oh, Pet's coming? Splendid! We'll just set the table for him and Lady Pala. What? Uh huh. So you can't tell if he's good or bad right now? That's not it, is it? Oh, he's just a guy that sounds like Pit. Why didn't you just say so? Number 9 today goes to Percy, our first child and apparently sidekick because if you can't hire your own, find a girl and have her give you a child so that you can have one. Arthur's bad luck and terrible life choices aside, Percy actually stands out on his own quite nicely thanks to a slightly different personality and far less irritating voice. Healing from the same hero school as Owain, Percy is quite the lucky boy. Stumbling upon treasures to the point where it doesn't even face him, he often comes off as a spoiled brat but really is just too lucky for his own good. Hell, he's even got his own dragon like Cherche and Jerome. Wait a second. If Jerome is childish Batman, does that make Percy childish Superman? Sorry, don't really know superheroes, so if that's horribly off, I do apologize. Anyway, let's talk stats. Percy, being the child of Arthur, isn't all that strong on his own at his base class. 
With mediocre strength and excelling in luck, Percy falls far below the standards of Cherche. However, once you add in his mother's stats, he could become an absolute god. In Revelations, I put Arthur with Effie, who, as we know, is the equivalent of putting Primal Groudon into a Fire Emblem game. While his luck and defense do drop a little, Percy becomes much stronger while also picking up boosts in HP and speed, allowing him to become a truly fearsome unit. Though he still needs to be wary of Anmyojin sorcerers, Percy can very well hold his own on the battlefield given great weapons and support. Being a Wyvern Rider gives him access to the beloved Wyvern Lord class, which would put his strength and defense at 60% and 65% respectively, and allow him to kick major ass across the board. Also of note is the Berserk class, which he gets through Arthur and can be put to terrifyingly strong use if combined with the skills learned in the Great Knight and General classes he adopts from his mother. As Berserker, Percy has 63% HP, 70% strength, 63% luck, and solid enough defenses to where Berserker's flimsiness isn't really noted until a magic user comes around. Overall, Percy has the potential to be one of the strongest units in the game, just as long as he has a strong mother such as Effie and Charlotte. It doesn't entirely hurt that his voice actor is the same guy who voices Pitt in Kid Icarus Uprising. Don't believe me? Listen to these two little snippets. This a dead end? Yes, uh, no? <sighs> We're losing our grip here! No, I just need to think. Could you think a little faster, please? I'm feeling lucky! Bombastic beatdown blow! As strong as Percy is, he's nowhere near the bulkiest unit in the game. No one knows this better than our number 8 entry, who can easily tear Percy in half with a single shot. Well, that's certainly ironic, considering she's otherwise terrified of men, aside from when she's busy making fanfiction for them. Whoa! When'd you get here, Blazing Knight? I mean, you're totally right, but she's not some lovey-dovey layabout, you know. Sure off anyone blind. Man, woman, or child. I was here the entire time, and yes, yeah, she will rob anyone blind, but given just how great she is on the battlefield, she'll take both your money and your life. We can at least say hi next time when you walk in, I would've made cookies. Wait... Oh no... Nina, get out of my safe now! Um, does she do that often? Unfortunately so. Now, stay down. I don't wanna see- And she's gone! God damn it. That's right, we have Nina today in our number 8 spot. Nina, otherwise known as Our Romance meets Robin Hood in Pigtails, is no joke no matter where you put her. Battlefield? Watch the fuck out, Wyvern Lords. Recon? She'll get whatever you need without any issues. Convincing Soleil to be the lesbian option instead of Rajat? Well, two out of three ain't bad, right? Now, I'm not gonna lie, the first time I saw Nina, I really didn't like her but immediately gave her credit points for directly tying into Niles' lore, a character who really didn't have any outside of- and I do apologize for this accent that I'm about to put on- <clears throat> Yo! I like to bane and rob places! Unless you dug deep into those support conversations. The more I got to know about her though, the more connected I became, and I can safely say that personality-wise, she's in my top 5 for my fate's children. That being said, we're ranking these children on an overall stance just on personality. And unfortunately for Nina, there's some people that just happen to hit a bit harder than her coming up. She really isn't a slouch given her mother is none other than the magical glass cannon that shoots out rainbows and sonic bursts of Onichan! Elise. Elise is the one parent, aside from maybe Nyx, who has growth rates strong enough in one category to where the effectiveness of the child can be completely reworked, and Nina has experienced just that. On her own, Nina is pretty mixed, sporting 45% in strength while sporting 30% in magic. However, Elise completely turns that over, as her base 65 magic gives Nina, before class, a 48% magic growth. Now, as good as that is, we need to give her a class to call home. Unfortunately, the Dark Knight class, gifted to her by the daddy she loves to hate oh so much, Niles is a perfect fit. The Dark Knight class boosts her defense and strength significantly while pushing her magic up slightly higher. Now, I've no said before that balanced units are not usually good, but Nina is one of a few units that's able to pull it off, thanks to nearly 60% in magic and 45% in strength, numbers you really can't scoff off for the ever one. If you want something that sticks to Nina's bows, however, look no further than the Adventurer class. 
Not only is she one of the only units that will be able to use this class effectively, but she becomes a special tank while taking on great speed, meaning she'll be able to strike hard with the Shining Bow while breaking away quickly. She may not be able to use offensive skills with the Shining Bow, but don't worry. Movement plus one, lucky seven, pass, live to serve, and inspiration make a very good skill set for a magical adventurer. Huh. Maybe this is what Elise meant when she said she's ready for an adventure? Perhaps the number seven entry knows. You know, it's got to suck being the child of the one person who is able to save everything. There's a whole bunch of expectations set on you, and all you can do is study what your parent does so that when they fail, you can take their place. Some practice for swordsmanship, others hit the books. But Shigore? He just draws pictures and sings one song over and over and over again. Yes, number 7 on the list is Shigore, a Zora son and one that doesn't carry a tune nearly as well. That may not sound all that fair, but when you consider that Azora gets a songstress class and Shigore doesn't get a male counterpart class like, say, Sainer, it's clear one is able to hit all the right notes while the other is too busy doodling in his sketchbook and one-upping Kagero in the process. Fortunately though, his personality is an absolute gold mine, having the sweet tones that Azora has while being much more open. Shigore trades mystery for warmth, and overall makes him a much more likable character in my eyes than Azora. Sorry, love. From being in tune with Mother Nature by being able to be around animals with just his singing voice, to helping foxes skydive, Shigore is a really sweet person. Surprisingly, Shigore is more Avatar-like than Korin in terms of his personality as he tries to support those around him while having his own personality, and not taking the center stage for himself. This plays out on the battlefield as well, where Shigore has extra HP, speed, and luck thanks to Azora marrying Jacob. While he does take a slight hit in his strength stats, it's nothing that can't be remedied. I personally prefer Shigore as a Wyvern Lord, where he's able to stay on a mount while picking up more strength and defense reaching 50% in each, thanks to the Wyvern Lord class boosts alongside HP, skill, and speed. While he may not be able to sing, he does make an exceptionally good rally unit, as he gets rally speed from being a Falcon Knight, rally defense from being a Wyvern Lord, and rally resistance from being a strategist, while being able to go great distances due to having a mount in all three of those classes. If you were to round out his skills with Amaterasu from being a Kinchi Knight, and Tonebreaker from being a butler, Shigore becomes a very reliable support unit that will always have your back no matter what. This amount of support is really what makes Shigore my number 7 entry. Hmm, what could this be? A child who sleeps all day? Writing all haiku? As a college student, I can completely relate. Sometimes days are just so draining that you want to go home, Lay in a hammock that your mom made out of blankets and just go the fuck to sleep. Or perhaps sketch down a couple ideas. That being said, our next entry isn't exactly the busy beaver type. In fact, she's the exact opposite. You know the saying, I'm seeing stars? Yeah, her eyes literally have star pupils. So, Mitama, let's talk about her. Hailing from the same startling lazy pile as Zama lies in, Mitama is not very outgoing. It could basically sum up her life in the following mantra. Sleep, wake up, write a couple haikus, go back to sleep, repeat. That's literally Mitama's character, and all you would ever need to know. However, when it comes to the battlefield, Mitama's laziness quickly turns into a fierce determination, as she is easily one of the best supporting children in Fates alongside Shigore. Having a natural maid like Felicia as a mother really doesn't hurt to solidify that title, as Felicia might drop a lot of Mitama's natural stats, but does boost Mitama's luck and resistance, allowing her to have some bulk in one area or another. In addition to this, Mitama has free rally skills at her disposal thanks to her parents. Rally Luck, from Mitama's own base class Shrine Maiden, Rally Magic, from the Anmyoshi class inherited from Mizama, and Rally Resistance, from the Strategist class inherited by Felicia. In addition, Felicia gifts Mitama with the Maid class, which comes with Tonebreaker, and makes Mitama very magically tanky, all things considered. I personally prefer Mitama as the Priestess class, as it allows her to play a much more defensive role and heal with 45% magic. 
Sure, it's nothing like my number one pick's magic stat, but 45% isn't really anything awful whatsoever. This also makes for an easy fifth skill selection, as Live to Serve from the Maid class will prove useful while Mitama is a priestess. Mitama is a character that a lot of people will often pass up. Sure, her haiku is cute, but that's really all she has. For me though, that's enough, as some of her haiku comes is perfect comic relief, and in a game full of over-the-top characters, I can definitely appreciate the simplicity. So, you know that feeling when you're growing up when you have a little bit too much pop and sugar? Your heart is racing, you feel like you can do anything, and you are very loud. Now imagine if you were like that all the time, but you're not quite you. Instead, you're a child of a very emotional man that we blame everything on, and you are given a bow and arrow. No more Mr. Nice Guy! Okay, Karagi, I get it! At our number 5 spot today, we have Karagi, an insufferably loud child given how reserved and quiet Takami can be. Karagi is very much like Spongebob in energy. He tries to stay very optimistic, quickly gets over rough patches, and again is very loud. That being said, he is quite amusing. Not one to back down from a challenge, and thanks to countless hours hunting despite his mother's initial wishes to save a fucking side and study for a while, it's at a level with a bow and arrow where he apparently already surpasses Takumi's skill, as according to Takumi. I think Takumi might be dying himself a little too much, because even though Karagi is pretty damn good, he will never match Takumi's levels as long as Takumi has the Fujin Yumi. Dropping some HP and luck for increased defense and resistance pre-class bonus, Karagi pretty much stays the same with Oboro as the mother, which is probably a good thing. Everyone else so far has taken pretty major nerfs and buffs, but they eventually return to how they were before the mother with slight buffs. With minimal changes, Karagi is able to be very potent in whatever class you place him in. I personally prefer Karagi like Takumi to be in the sniper class. As a sniper, Karagi gets some much needed strength, speed, and defense, making him a unit with pretty good survivability that can hit very hard. Coupling into this is a few of the skills he's able to pick up. Run Heaven and Quixotic from Basara, Granted by Takumi, Bowfare from Sniper, and Poison Strike from a Boros Mechanist, so that an ally can finish off whatever Kragi doesn't. Just name a few skills. If Sniper doesn't fit your forte though, Spear Master, granted again by Takumi, works just about as well if you have too many bow users on your team. His growths are only marginally different. As potent as Kragi can be though, our next pick is infinitely better. So much so that he rivals his father in terms of strength and, special weapons aside, is possibly even better. I can only imagine the sort of headache princes and princesses have to endure. Wake up, do royal activities, and try to prepare yourself for the chance that you need to one day assume the throne. It not only sounds quite tedious, but also quite boring. Sometimes you just need to kick back and relax. Enjoy life while you can. For every Xander, there's a Shiro. So, Let's talk Shiro. Coming in at number 4 is the second most broken child in Fire Emblem Fates, Shiro. Before we talk about his competitive prowess though, let's talk personality. Shiro is pretty much frat boy meets big brother. He's very chill and relaxed, getting along pretty easily with just about everyone in the army. He seems to get along best with male Kana in my experience, who Shiro treats as a little brother even though they're not related. Well, at least in my file anyway. He's just a very sweet child getting adjusted to his new lifestyle, and doing so in stride without putting too much pressure on himself because, unlike Korn, he realizes he isn't perfect. Jesus, that's the third time I've shaded Korn this video. One more time and Korn will evolve during the night time into Hydreigon. Now there is a class change I want to see. Since Shiro is sweet and all, let's talk about how he kicks the living fuck out of everything. Shiro has a mother in Kigero, the strongest of three ninjas and is naturally fast as per result of being a ninja. Because Kigero is Shiro's mother, Shiro's base strength and speed go up, with strength hitting almost 60% growth before class growths. To put things into perspective, Effie, when you take away her class, has a 60% strength growth. So. Shiro hits just about as hard as the hardest hitting character in the game, and is already a lot faster. Got it? Alright, let's keep going. Now, take into account the kinds of skills that he can have at his disposal. 
on his own, he gets access to the Pissarra class, which again gets Friend Heaven and Quixotic. His father, Ryoma, gifts him with the Sword Master class, which grants Shiro the skills Astra and Vantage. Finally, his mother Kagero grants Shiro access to the Master Ninja class, one of my favorite classes to put Shiro in and home of the skill Lethality. All five of these skills together turn Shiro into an offensive god that doesn't even need a special weapon to do all sorts of damage. For Shiro, I present to you two builds. One that goes for all-out offense, while the other aims for abusing his skill set. As a Spear Master, which is Shiro's other natural promotion, Shiro has over 70% in strength while carrying great HP and speed with good defenses to boot. In combination with his skills, Shiro turns into nothing short of a god, being able to dodge hits, kill just about everything in sight, and tank whatever he can't dodge. If the number one entry is nearby, he will literally never go down if played right. His Master Ninja set is also of good note too, carrying a slightly higher skill growth rate and skill cap, as well as higher speed and resistance. As I've said before, this class with Shiro would especially be used to try to trigger his skills as often as possible. Now, let's just say Shiro has the maximum skill that you can have for a Master Ninja, excluding the Secret Book, Rally Skill, and Personal Caps. 35. How skills work is that the skills with the lowest activation rate are calculated first, followed by the most likely to be activated. So, with this set, Lethality would be checked first, followed by Astra, then Red Heaven. Taking into account Quixotic, with 35 skill, Shiro would have 24% chance of activating Lethality, or just under 1 4. That's pretty damn good for a one shot skill. Astra has slightly higher odds, being at 33%, while Red Heaven goes all the way up to 68%. To put things into perspective, the odds of one of these skills not activating is only 17% or just under 1 in 5. Shiro, in essence, is a walking, talking, fun-loving, lady-charming, ticking time bomb for any enemy within a 50-foot radius. If Shiro can find you, he will most certainly kill you. Don't worry, though, as our number 3 entry is sure to have a charm to save your Norian butt should you be so unfortunate to run into Shiro on the battlefield. Fair finger of typing, where are you taking me today? On this glorious, luminous, lustrous, legendary February day, a chosen one has been cast in the Iron of Fates to take on my number 3 entry. What could such a wondrous selection look like? Are they built like the Sun God Apollo? Or perhaps slender like Malouetta? Oh, it's just Ophelia. Hey girl! Take this maiden seriously! Okay, damn, jeez! one of the few characters that's able to take on the Dark Knight class and do it effectively, especially given that, as a Dark Knight, none of Ophelia's growths will be below 40%. If you wish for something more magical,
screen set, our last two entries have that extra oomph that makes them really stand out above the rest. You know, Fire Emblem certainly seems like a progressive series. I may have only played a couple of the games, but what started off as a series about saving kingdoms became a holy grail for tackling moral grey. With the new mechanics changes each game brings, along with each new cast of characters and their deep backgrounds, the Fire Emblem games just seem to be pushing the boundaries for innovation. That being said, I do have one complaint. I think it's awesome that Fates introduced LGBT marriages in the forms of Niles and Raja, but let's be real here. Why is Soleil not the lesbian option? Number 2 on today's list is indeed Soleil, possibly the cutest child unit in Fates and one that adds lore to both her father Laszlo, I mean Inigo, and her grandmother Olivia. Soleil is very flirtatious like her father, but instead of focusing on men, her eyes are captured by the cute girls that surround her. I only have a couple questions after playing all three pathways, and one of them is why is Soleil not the lesbian option? She certainly got more appealing supports than Raja, and doesn't have to stalk you around to get your affection. Plus her character already implies that she likes women. Literally, just flip the code and let Soleil date women. Sorry, ranting aside. Outside of being the lesbian that never was, Soleil's personality is a nice mix between Ophelia's and Nina's. She's certainly more grounded than Ophelia, and is just as prone to fall for cute people as Nina is. Her supports mainly focus on this, with additional supports focusing on positive body image, aka stripping in public, as well as her desire to be a warrior being blocked by, you guessed it, cute girls. Man, I wonder what Soleil would be like if she ever met Cynthia. At any rate, while her supports suggest she has focus issues, her growth suggests anything but. With a mother and Perry, Soleil is almost as offensively focused as Shiro. The main difference being that Soleil doesn't get Swordmaster or Basara, and fuss no Astra, Vantage, or Rend Heaven. Regardless, she does pick up some great skills that allow her to play in any situation. She gains Soul from her hero class, as well as Aegis from Paladin and Luna, and Armored Blow from Great Knight, both of which she gains from Parry. Her fifth set is a bit of a grab bag, and a slap that should be taken into consideration. If you choose to make Soleil a Paladin, where she'll sport 70% strength with lower skill and speed, Axe Breaker from Soleil's hero class will definitely come in handy, especially if the enemy comes packed with a hammer, and Soleil's physical bulk isn't quite the greatest. If you choose to remake Soleil into a Master Ninja though, Lethality will definitely come into play due to Master Ninja's high skill boosts and cap. Although she'd end up being an inferior version of Shiro, what she does have is focus in keeping herself safe instead of going all out. Her skills allow her to perform this well though, so she shouldn't be too down. Regardless, in my opinion, Soleil is easily one of the best written children in Fire Emblem Fates. She has drive, she has focus, she adds lore to her family, is great on the battlefield, and has a very unique character. It's almost a shame that our number one entry exists, otherwise Soleil would easily take the cake. Before we go into number one though, allow me to make a few honorable mentions. First, we have Dryer, a character I really didn't connect to until I saw his 1C support conversation with Karagi that made me laugh hysterically. Then there's Midori, a rather sweet character who was running quite well, but unfortunately just wasn't able to make the top 10 cut. Finally, there's Valoria, a child unit who can be just as terrifying as Percy, but putting her into anything besides Wolfsinger feels like I'm betraying who she really is. Anyway, on to our number one entry. So far on this list, we've covered characters from two main categories, emotionally strong and battlefield strong. While some characters fall more into one category than the other, looking at you Sophie, the higher entries get closer and closer to melding these perfectly. In Forest, he's able to not only fit that together flawlessly, he's able to do it looking fierce all the while. Holy mother of god, Forrest is far away one of the best running characters in this game, and that's a high mark! Considering this is a game centering around the adult characters, you'd think the children who don't have any relevance on the plot, or at least a semi-existing plot, would be placed more on the back burner. But couldn't be any further from the truth with Forrest, as he easily writes in as one of the best units inside of Fire Emblem Fates in both character and battlefield presence, enough to where he surpasses his father before even waking up. Forrest, the son of Leo, appears at first to be rather flamboyant due to his attire, 
But the matter of a fact is that he simply takes a liking to women's fashion. This is mostly fueled by a dress Lise gave to one of Forrest's caretakers when he was little, which Forrest put on and Leo called him cute in it. From that point on, he's been obsessed with women's fashion, knowing how to sew all sorts of women's garments that I probably couldn't even name. As you could imagine, he did receive ridicule for his choices, including his own father, hashtag blame Leo, but it ended up making Forrest a very strong person in the end. Forrest's personal strength is why I love Forrest, and the main driver as to why I put him higher on my list to begin with. But then I looked at his stats. Holy fuck these stats! I expected him to have high magic to begin with, but thanks to Nyx, his growths just go through the fucking roof! While Nyx does initially drop Forrest's magic stat a bit, you have to remember that this is Fates, and Nyx is the best option Leo has for getting a magic-heavy son because, let's be real, Selena won't be doing him any favors. Nyx also brings some much-needed speed and luck too, making Forrest hit hard and dodge often. Once you add in class growth though, holy fuck does Forrest go through the roof! Enough to where I have not one but three recommend classes for him. First off, I suggest the Offense Heavy Sorcerer class. As a sorcerer, Forrest hits an ungodly 83% magic growth rate, meaning his magic will upscale hard and he'll be able to kill like crazy once you couple that with the sorcerer's high cap for magic. Next, I point you to the main support set the Forrest has, Strategist. While almost all of Forrest's growths are lower than they would be as a sorcerer, the Strategist does come with the ability to heal, something that couples quite well with high magic and Forrest's access to live to serve. Finally, I point you to an unlikely source, the Adventurer. Once you get Forrest to a C rank in bows, he'll be able to hold the Shining Bow and truly, well, shine. Also being able to heal, Adventurer provides Forrest with higher speed and resistance than his other two options, giving plenty of reason for the player to at least try it out. For the Sorcerer and Strategist sets, you want Forrest holding Lightning, Snake Spirit, and Mjolnir. Lightning and Snake Spirit are both magical, brave weapons, with Lightning being weaker while having far less damage stat penalties. Mjolnir is a magic killer weapon, so it'll crit often and, with Forrest's magic, hit hard. As for skills, Vengeance and Life Taker are musts for Forrest, while the other skills can float in and out depending on what class Forrest is. Movement plus one from Outlaw always helps, as well as Tone Breaker from Butler, Bow Breaker from Sorcerer, and Shuriken Breaker from Bow Knight. For sheer versatility makes him a truly uncanny unit, and with his high magic, good speed, and amazing personality, Forrest easily takes today's number one spot. And there we go! There's my top 10 favorite Fire Emblem Fates children. Of course this is all my own personal opinion, so let me know who your favorite children are down in the comments. Also, I'd like to give a huge shout out and thank you to Mr. Blazing Knight for making a cameo in today's video. I can't even put into words just how thankful I am for you letting me be a part of your 15,000 subscriber special, and I can't wait to see what the future holds for the both of us. Oh, this post note that has Blazing Knight x Joey ideas written on it? Don't worry your pretty little heads about it. Anyway, if you guys liked what you saw, please feel free to leave a like and subscribe to see up to four videos a week. If you'd like to see my collab with Blazing Knight, where we went over who we felt were the top 10 overrated characters in Fire Emblem, click the box over here. To see my most recent Fire Emblem video that has nothing to do with Pokemon, click here to see my video about how I rank the top 10 royals of Fire Emblem Fates. If you'd like to see my record-paced Kid Icarus Uprising speedrun, click the box over here. As always, thank you so much for watching everyone. Until next time, this is Joey Pals, signing out.